everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. If not, welcome back. It's lovely to have you. Uh, my name's Katie and today we are talking about my favourite topic, books. I wanted to go over with you my favourite books of 2019. I read, I think I did pretty good this year. Not amazing, but better than I have in the last couple of years. I read, I think it's 56 books um, so far and I'm filming on the 9th of December. So I have a, like, uh, I'll see if I can get to 60. Um, so I had a pretty good reading year, nothing spectacular, but I think solid. Shall we say solid? Is that a good word? And beside me here, I have a stack of books that really rocked my world. I do have a reading diary that I haven't been great at filling out the last, say, maybe two or three months. So I will be using this and looking through this to help me remember and talk about the books from the beginning of the year. So I will try to go in roughly the order that I read them. Obviously I have kind of up until the end of August literally in order in this book and then beyond that I'm kind of playing a bit of a guessing game. But the very first book that I wanted to talk about was The Lucky Galar. I did actually start this book in 2018. It took me like five months to read and I don't know why. It was slow going, but not because I didn't enjoy it. I adored it, but it wasn't a page turner, I, which is weird, but it's, it's just the truth. I basically picked this book up because I remember Imogen Walters asking me in a comment under one of my videos about recommendations for Australian novels. And I remember responding being like, I, I don't really have any recommendations. I haven't read a lot of Australian novels, which just kind of really upset me <laughs> realizing that. So I went out and bought this book. <laughs> like it was one of the first Australian novels that I saw um, next time I was in a bookshop. So I picked it up and I'm so glad I did because I just, there's something so subtle but really special about this book. So I'll give you a brief summary and it sounds ridiculous, but I promise it works. It's, it's brilliant in my opinion. Basically, it's set in like the 60s, the 1960s and into the 70s, I think, in a very small outback town in Australia. And it's loosely based like on true events with like the, the dish, the satellite dish that helps with the moon landing. Um, but more than that, it's about just the people in this town and just like the goings on in a small country town in outback Australia in this period. But the kicker is, <laughs> that this whole thing is narrated by a pet galah. Now, I didn't realize that people didn't know what a galah is until I spoke about this book. A galah is basically just like a native Australian. I think they are also native to kind of like islands around Australia and stuff, like not exactly Australia, but mostly Australia. They're native to Australia. They're a, it's a parrot. They're kind of like a cockatoo. I think they technically are a cockatoo, but when we say cockatoo, we mean like the white sulfur crested cockatoos. A galah is like a slightly smaller pink and gray parrot and they are noisy <laughs> they are so noisy and they usually live in very very big flocks this is a pet galah who's obviously isolated and she's basically she just she's on a radar so she's telling us about the lives of these people in a really observant but also slightly alien and removed way and it's kind of really incredible. The other thing is, and this is where it sounds really weird, but again, I promise it works, <laughs> is that she can basically get messages from the dish. It's not a big theme throughout the book, but it just kind of pops up. It is explained how the, how the galahs kind of got tuned in to the dish. Um, and it's just, it's this weird kind of surreal element to a very, very mundane story. So in the um, Leuchtturm uh, like reading journal, uh, it gives you a opportunity to rate a book out of six and I gave this five stars. The next book I read in February and I also gave five stars, it was Surfacing by Margaret Atwood. I read three Margaret, four Margaret Atwood books this year. Yes, one was a reread. Um, oh, would this be my favourite or my second favourite that I read this year? It was great. It was one of her earlier novels, was it? It wasn't her first, but it was an earlier one. And I really, really liked it. So I remember loving this book and I do remember like vaguely what happened. Um, and I, you know, certain points stick out more than others, but I'm going to read you what I wrote down just cause you know, it's been many months since I read it. I wrote, I really enjoyed my first Atwood book in a while. It was strange in that it didn't have a huge plot. The unnamed protagonist goes back to find her missing father and she breaks away from societal expectations of women and almost loses or discovers, question mark, reality in the process. 
And then I wrote down a few of the quotes that really stood out to me, but they're in like the final pages, so I won't read you those. But yeah, basically it's kind of really like nothing happens, but so much happens sort of a book um, in that, yeah, this woman just goes back to her like family where she grew up, which is a very isolated part of Canada from memory. It's a very isolated environment. And so a lot goes on in her head and her, the way she's viewing the world and the people that she's with. And a lot changes for her in this really kind of messed up way. And I know not everybody's a fan of Margaret Atwood. Obviously, she's not perfect. Nobody is. Uh, but I have loved her since I read The Handmaid's Tale when I was 16. And I really, really, really liked this book. In a way, it kind of reminds me of The Handmaid's Tale in that we have, you know, like this female unnamed protagonist who it's very much a lot of the plot is just what goes on in her head. Um, and you know, there's some really dark, fucked up elements to it, um, as well as a lot of, I don't know, questioning, playing around with um, what it is to be a woman um, in in the world, in society. So I really enjoyed it. It's not a very long book, but it definitely was a standout for me this year, and I loved it. The next was a book that I got through the Life's Library. The Life's Library is a book club run by Rosianna and John um, of the Vlogbrothers. Um, they started at the beginning of this year and I signed up because it's actually really quite reasonable. I think it ends up being about $35 Australian and I get a book sent to me every six weeks um, with kind of a note from either Rosianna or John with some little goodies. Um, like I've gotten a tote bag and some stickers and some postcards and, and I haven't loved every book. I haven't even read every book, but it's been really great in getting me out of my box and reading authors and books that I might never have picked up myself or in some cases didn't even know existed and actually a couple of them make it onto my list of favorite books of the year so that's amazing the first was a field guide to getting lost by rebecca solnit this was amazing <laughs> i loved it so much i gave it a solid six out of six rating now i actually hated it at like in the first chapter because i thought for some reason I don't know, maybe because it's a book club, I just assumed it was all going to be fiction. So I started reading this book and I'm the sort of person that I like skim over the blurb. I don't even fully read the letter that Rosianna sent with the book. Um, I just kind of dive in without thinking too much about what the book is or what it's going to be, usually. <laughs> and so I did that with this and I had in my head that it was a fiction book. And so I start reading. I'm like, this is the most obnoxious, pretentious novel I've ever read. <laughs> Because it's like this, uh, to me, it was this character sitting at um, the dining room table of their family, like quoting off philosophers and stuff. And I just was like, I'm not, I'm not into this. But once I realized that it was actually nonfiction and kind of the point of it, I fell very quickly and very deeply in love. So it kind of is part memoir, part philosophy. I don't know. I don't want to sound too grand, but... Um, I really loved it and actually I have a bunch of pages flagged. I even started highlighting throughout it, which is something I do, I have noticed myself doing more these days, but I didn't, I suppose I, this was one of the first ones that I really started doing that too. For example, I just flipped to this page. I highlighted, but fear of making mistakes can itself become a huge mistake. One that prevents you from living. For life is risky and anything less is already loss. Another one that stood out to me, which clearly highlights my frame of mind then and probably a lot of the time. Worry is a way to pretend that you have knowledge or control over what you don't. And it surprises me, even in myself, how much we prefer ugly scenarios to the pure unknown. I wrote, I loved this memoir, although it could fit into so many other genres too. This was so evocative of particular times and places, and it made me think about the beauty and mystery of occupying the place and time that I do. To me, the themes were really about place, identity and belonging and what those things mean. And it felt like a journey following the author as she asked herself these big questions. I want to read it again. Then I had a great month in March. I literally read two books in two days and both got six out of six stars for me. The first was Foreign Soil by Maxine Benaba clark This book was incredible. Another Australian book and author. Um, Maxine Benema Clark is widely published Australian writer of Afro-Caribbean descent and the author of the acclaimed memoir The Hate Race. I have bought The Hate Race, I haven't read it yet though, but this book just... Oh, this might be my favourite, favourite book of this year. I think it'd be in the top three anyway. This was just incredible and it brought up 
almost every emotion I am capable of feeling I experienced whilst reading this book. It was intense and beautiful and harrowing and just gorgeous. It is not a novel, it's a collection of short stories, but really the theme is foreign soil, of people living in a place that perhaps they don't feel they belong to or other people perceive them as not belonging to. And I bought this book from readings one day because I had an extra lunch break or something. Something happened where a shift got cancelled at work and so I spent like a good two hours in readings and I had vaguely remembered the name Maxine Benneber Clark and it was in the Australian fiction section and as I've said I'm trying to read a bit more of that. I think I should get back into that. I think I've slowed down a little. But anyway, I picked up this book and I flicked to early on in the book. The first story is actually about a Sudanese girl in Footscray. <laughs> I live in Footscray, it's my suburb. I've never loved a place any more than I love Footscray. That almost made me cry. I've never felt at home anywhere and I've moved about quite a bit until I landed in Footscray and I, I loved this place the minute I stepped in it. And reading about a girl walking down, you know, the same street that I walk down nearly every day and walking past the same shops and places that I walk past every day was just really, really cool. Um, but then added on top of that, talking about the faces that I see a lot because Footscray is, I think, like one of the most diverse suburbs definitely in Melbourne, probably in Australia. It has a massive Sudanese community and Vietnamese community. Um, it's an incredible place. And so this book kind of explored all of that in my suburb, literally around the corner from me. So of course I had to buy the book, but there were other stories from across the world. Um, several of those that were set in Australia were about refugees or first um, generation immigrants. I remember kind of feeling like how I feel with Doctor Who. <laughs> with this book, how, you know, at the end of the tenure of a particular doctor, say you're obsessed with 10, I mean, most people are, can't blame you. And as we're getting towards the end of his tenure, it's like you get really upset and you don't want him to leave. You don't want it to end. I felt very much like that with every single story in here. I just didn't want it to end. I wanted it to be the whole book and I was almost mad that it was ending. And then I would start the next story and kind of just be like, whatever, you're not as good as the last one. <laughs> But then within a couple of pages, I was completely hooked. I was completely invested in that story and the characters, and I didn't want that one to end. It was gripping from start to finish. And obviously, of course, some stories stood out to me more. Some uh, affected me personally, emotionally more, but there was not a single one that I was not drawn into. And actually, I was very excited because after reading and falling head over heels in love with this book, I did end up looking Maxine up. And I realized that a week after I finished reading this, she was hosting a book launch for a book that she had been involved in. She was the um, main editor of a collection, um, which I will talk about later because it also makes it into this list. And so I got to meet her briefly and she signed my book, which was very exciting. I asked her to sign this one because I loved it so much. She wrote, Dear Katie, Words Change the World, Maxine Benneber Clark. Mm -hmm. So I fangirled a little bit and I definitely feel like I found a new favourite writer this year. And literally the day after I finished reading Foreign Soil, I read this. We crossed a bridge and it trembled. Voices from Syria. This was another book that came through the Life's Library and it was, again, it was so intense. It is not fiction at all. In fact, it's the opposite. It is literally, the Voices from Syria is a perfect byline or subtitle or whatever you call it, um, in that every single one of these is just people from Syria telling their story about the revolution and then the life life in Syria before and after the revolution. And the book doesn't have a, like an outside narration really. Like we do have an introduction, which kind of explains overall, um, like the progression of the history of Syria of like modern times in the last, I don't know when it starts about 50 years ago. And then the stories that we hear from these individuals um, are laid out in sort of in order of what happened basically. So we kind of get like a first person history lesson of Syria as it was experienced by these people. And some of these are literally like half a page long. Others are like 10 pages long. And I just think it, like Syria is something I know, I knew very little about and I still don't know nearly enough. But having this kind of, I just think 
I am so grassroots oriented when it comes to my politics and I think there is nothing more important and more valuable than the voices of people with a lived experience and that is what this is. It is a collection of exactly that. And obviously it is edited, it is curated, but I think, you know, just for 300 pages it was such, such, <laughs> it was such a valuable use of my time reading this book and I really feel like I learnt so much. Um, but also more importantly that the experience was humanized for me. It is so easy to talk about, especially international politics, as very black and white, as right and wrong, and as, you know, groups of people, and like they become dissociated from the individual experience. This was exactly the individual experience put back into all of that context, which was is, is just hugely powerful. This was, as you'd expect about a country in conflict, it was really difficult to read, um, a lot of loss, um, a lot of pain, a lot of fear, um, a lot of anger. I wrote, the first entry set the scene for how hard hitting this book would be. A Syrian citizen is only a number. Dreaming is not allowed. And I learnt a lot about how the situation in Syria developed. The Syrian state inherited a Syrian army designed by the French, and the French designed it to divide and rule. Another one I read in March, God, March, February, March, April were great months for me in terms of my reading, um, was actually an audiobook, and it was The Unexpected Joy of Being Sober by Catherine Gray. I loved this. Now, I um, listened to it around my six year sober bursary, um, and I just felt like, I mean, I don't really have a problem. Being, I mean, it's never easy, but I don't really have a problem being sober anymore. But I was just feeling quite emotional around my six year anniversary of becoming sober. And so stumbling across this audiobook was really wonderful. Um, I obviously identified a lot with her story. She walks us through her own experience of, um, I don't know if she calls it alcoholism, but you know, that might be one word that we use to describe what she went through um, and then becoming sober. And it's kind of like she mixes facts and science around alcoholism, alcohol abuse, substance abuse and sobriety, along with just her really raw personal experience of it all. And so I loved it like as a woman, and as a kind of like a younger woman, she's a little bit older than me and she was older than me when she stopped drinking. But I just feel like I've often felt at least that my experience of alcoholism, substance abuse, whatever you want to call it, is often diminished because people don't look at me and see an alcoholic. Um, like especially, I mean, I've been sober for six years now, so I stopped when I was 23 and people don't think of a young woman at 23 possibly being like having a problem with alcohol. I do feel like a big part of my problem with alcohol was genetic. And so her talking about the science, at least as far as we understand it now, of how fucking hard it is to become sober and what that journey is for people <laughs> was just <laughs> so affirming to me. <laughs> Um, especially because <laughs> I know, I honestly, <laughs> I know in my heart that that's the hardest thing I've ever done and it's still so hard, but I think because people so often didn't really recognize how bad it was, um, cause I'm high functioning and cause I'm young and I'm female, all of those reasons, I think people are proud of me, people are happy, you know, oh, cool, Katie doesn't drink anymore. Um, but I don't think very many people, even people close to me kind of get <laughs> how hard that was and still can be. The next book I read in April was Growing Up African in Australia. And I have a couple, this is kind of a series. I have also got Growing Up Muslim in Australia, Growing Up Aboriginal in Australia. I know there's an LGBT one. There's a whole bunch of them. This is the only one I've read so far though. And I went to the book launch for this because it was edited and the launch was kind of hosted by Maxine Benneber Clark. So I went along to this and uh, part of the ticket when you purchase the ticket is you got the book and I read it the next day, finished it and it was amazing. Kind of along the same lines of we crossed, crossed a bridge and it trembled in that this is like a collection of testimonies, experiences from individuals. I'll read you what I wrote about it. I'm so happy I went to the book launch for this little gem. Simply, it's a collection of stories and experiences of people of the African diaspora living and growing up in Australia. There are lots of stories of racism, but also funny, heartbreaking, bittersweet testimonies of finding or losing home, 
a family of culture of identity. It was a wonderfully diverse book with, in terms of voices represented as well as in tone and experience. And I love that this series exists. I wish it was more popular. I wish more Australians knew about it and read it. And I definitely, a big aim for me in the coming year is to read a few others. Like I said, I have a couple already, so that shouldn't be too hard. Also in April, I read Wonder Smith, the, the Calling of Morrigan Crow. This is book two in the Nevermore series. I read Nevermore a couple of years ago when it first came out. Uh, this is like a children's fantasy um, story written by an Australian author, Jessica Townsend. And I love it. It is so fun, but so rich. And like, it just, it feels, it, it does feel a bit Harry Potter in the sense that, you know, it's these young people um, discovering this new magical realm and world and where they fit in it. Um, but I promise it stands on its two, own two feet. It is such a rich story and a rich world that is just, it's really well fleshed out, but it does not for a moment feel stale or slow. I absolutely adore it. If you like Harry Potter, you like fantasy, you enjoy reading a good kind of children's book every now and then, the Nevermore series, I don't think you can beat. It's fabulous. And this one, I gave a good solid six stars as well. I did the same for Nevermore the year before. Also in April, God, April was a great month. I think I read my favorite book of the year. It was City of Trees by Sophie Cunningham. Another Australian book. I actually did quite well on the Australian the reading more Australian books this year, I think. This was a collection of essays, I suppose, um, but the way they're framed is like nature writing mixed with memoir. And it was just incredible. I loved it. I bought it from the bookshop that I work at basically because I read this very, very short blurb, which read, I smelled the lemon scented gums before I saw them. It says a few other things, but I bought it because literally of that first line. <laughs> um, and I think she says somewhere in here that um, people either like just don't care about gum trees or they fucking love them. And I'm in that category of love them. Um, and I just, I adored this. I love her writing. She talks about a lot of different issues um, around politics and her experience as a gay woman. Um, but also it's just like this celebration of trees. Like, and every single essay or chapter, obviously we talk about lots of different things and her experience of the world. Um, but everything comes back to trees and I just, I thought it was just, it was delightful. I wrote, I absolutely adored this collection of essays. It explored themes of life, death, belonging, love, grief, all returning to trees and our connections to them. She contrasts the personal, like a loss of a loved one, with the global, like the loss of nature through climate change, with trees providing the link between the two. She also spoke a lot about walking and how walkers mark the earth and the earth in turn marks us moving, sorrowful, beautiful, hopeful. So kind of like February, March, April were really solid months of reading for me. And I read some of the most incredible books. Then I had a bit of a lull with some duds, I suppose, like the Day of Piglet and stuff, which were a bit eh. But then for my seven books in seven days, the first time I did the challenge, which was in late July, I read The Penelope Ad by Margaret Atwood. Uh, so I think I've read four Margaret Atwood books this year. And this I really, really enjoyed this. This was a lot lighter and more playful, I suppose, than surfacing, but it was still really, really solid. And yeah, I really liked it. Basically, it's a retelling of the Odyssey, um, but from the perspective of Penelope, which is super fun. And obviously with Margaret Atwood being kind of, you know, she's quite known for bringing feminism or her brand of feminism into her writing, um, we do explore some interesting themes. And I think, there are some pretty hard hitting moments in here. Um, I think it asks a lot of questions, um, but it's also really, really fun in a kind of, in a, in a playful, cheeky sort of way that turns things on its head um, and makes you look at something in a new way, which I suppose is the whole point of having Penelope tell her story. I wrote, it basically read like Penelope defending herself and telling her side of the story after so many centuries of other gods telling theirs. It was funny, savage, compelling, and feminist. All of the things I love about Atwood. The maids in particular were framed in a really poignant way. Another great Atwood read. In the same seven day challenge, I also read Notes to Self by Emily Pine. This was incredible. Um, I, oh, this made me laugh out loud and sob like a baby in equal measure. This was another kind of collection of essays, memoir sort of a book. Apparently I like them, or at least I have this year. And again, it really kind of touched on a lot of 
political topics, especially around women's bodies um, and that feminist kind of approach. I wrote, I adored this, intense, beautiful, heartbreaking, insightful, all of the things you want from an autobiography. Her alcoholic father, her sister's miscarriage, her own infertility, sexual abuse as a minor. I cried so much. This was up there with my favorite books of the year. I especially loved her exploration of aging, childlessness, and feminism. Absolute gem of a book. And she was really deliberate, I think, about confronting some really intense, difficult subjects head on, unapologetically. It was really intense, and I think that's why it was quite a roller coaster of emotions for me. Um, she expressed joy really beautifully but did not did not for a moment hesitate going to those really hard dark places um and it was i think it was incredible it was a it was a journey reading this even though it's only quite a short book and i read it in a day then more recently i read how to be spiritual without being religious by patrick d patrick miller now i think this bloke's like involved in or was involved in like the course in miracles sort of stuff which doesn't particularly interest me, but I loved this book. It is a very, very short read and I didn't just read it in a day, I read it in one sitting on my couch on an afternoon. I highlighted so much in this book because there was just so many moments of clarity um, for me. It was simple in that nothing was revolutionary and yet I had so many light bulb moments. Like so much was revealed without but it was all obvious. It was all there to be revealed, if that makes sense. It's just that someone stated it so clearly that all of a sudden I could see it for what it was. It's sort of how I felt. Basically, the author presents four steps to living spiritually. The first is releasing guilt. The second is gathering trust. The third is practicing patience. And the fourth is learning transcendence. I think probably number two, gathering trust, was the one that hit me the hardest that I perhaps need to learn most. Um, but I found them all really, really insightful, helpful, and just, I don't know, just amazing, really powerful. I'll read you a little bit. Faith grows from daily acts and decisions of trust. The capacity for trust rests chiefly on one's own trustworthiness. It is far easier to find reasons to trust others when you have every reason to trust yourself. And I loved particularly the part where he spoke about trust and skepticism. I'll read a few little bits that I highlighted. The silent partner of trust is skepticism. What a healthy skepticism contributes to faith is a sense of intuitive direction and wise choice. The role of skepticism is not to condemn that which is found to be untrustworthy, but to clarify one's appreciation of what is real and genuinely useful. Trust is appreciation extended towards the future. As such, the energy of trust derives from one's reservoir of appreciation for the present. And finally, another book that I read very recently in my most recent seven days, seven books in seven days, was The Summer Book. I loved this and it was another gem that came to me in the Life's Library. As I said in that seven books in seven days vlog, I don't really know how to describe this book and I don't really know why I liked it so much. It's really subtle. Uh, it kind of not a lot happens and yet it's so beautiful. It's so, so beautiful. Basically, the story is just about a young girl who's about six and her grandmother and her dad's in there a little bit too. Um, and they holiday in summer on an island off Finland. And it's just like the little adventures they go. And even when I say adventures, I mean like crawling under a tree or something. You know what I mean? Like they're so small and nothing grand at all that they're so real um and there's a real heart to this book um i do think that there's a little bit of a touch of darkness to it especially around the grandmother um and the idea of aging and mortality definitely kind of like underlies a lot of what she says and experiences um and just kind of like of losing independence there's only hints of it but it's enough to kind of make this book feel really i don't know like just real um, and to make you think and to make you feel. So this is not a book really that is driven by plot. Instead, it it is ultimately just about the characters and their interactions. Um, and I think it's just, there's something really sweet about it, um, but it doesn't feel surface level. It doesn't feel two dimensional. And also like there's just the cutest little drawings in here that are just so sweet. I feel like some kind of standout things from my reading experience this year would definitely be the Life's Library. That has been wonderful um, in getting me, oh, just introducing me to some new books. As I said, there's a couple that I haven't read yet because they were larger and I just, for whatever reason. But the ones that I have read, I've liked 
pretty much all of them really enjoyed obviously several and more than that they're just getting me out of my box and reading a few different things which is great the other thing that's been great is the book club that i'm hosting over on my patreon and discord server none of those books made it to this list but all of them have been good in that I've been reading different things and talking about them and experiencing them alongside other people who provide really interesting insights has been just really motivating for my reading in general and getting me thinking about books in a new way which has been helpful and we've already mentioned them but of course I have to thank all of my patrons over on Patreon for uh, supporting what I do online making these videos and everything but also making my reading journey especially towards the end of this year a lot more enjoyable and a lot richer I would say I'm um, reading alongside with you guys has just I don't know it's been really invigorating to my my experience as a reader um, and the way that I've appreciated books um, and learnt more through books has been really enhanced by um, my journey with you. If you'd like to learn more about the um, Blossom Book Club, uh, I will leave a link to the Patreon below. It's a sliding scale starting from just one dollar. You pick a, a tier that most aligns with you and your situation and whatever else. Um, and we read a book every month together, which is a lot of fun and we do live chats and stuff. But I do hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you have had a wonderful reading year and I would love to hear in the comments below or in a video response, whatever, in whatever medium, I'd love to hear about the books that you loved this year. If you think that you have a recommendation or two for me based on what I loved this year I would love to hear those below I do have several books that I have been recommended that I need to get to so let's hope I can do that in 2020 but thank you so much for watching I will talk to you next time and so much love bye